Good morning, everyone. I'm sure you all remember me and my wife, Serena. Today, we're going to be talking about artificial intelligence and specifically providing a survey of everything that you can now do with modern data-driven AI. So let's get started. So artificial intelligence is everywhere, from self-driving cars to autonomous drones to collaborative robots. We're adding AI to our products, our services, and our world. According to the McKinsey Global Institute, AI is expected to generate $13 trillion in real economic value by 2030. That's a 16% increase in our current global domestic product. In addition, by 2030, AI is expected to automate approximately 600 million jobs, and that's roughly 22% of all jobs that currently exist, likely gone within just 10 years. Fortunately, they're also predicting 700 million new jobs will be created by 2030, many of which will be jobs that require AI tech skills. Ultimately, this is going to have a tremendous impact on our labor economy in less than a decade. However, most software developers and IT professionals have not yet learned how to use these new AI tools in their professional toolkit. They don't have the skills necessary to meet the demands of an AI-first economy. As a result, they don't know what is currently possible with modern data-driven AI. They don't know how to add AI capabilities into their products and services. And they don't know how to tell if an AI solution is going to provide real economic value for their customers. Essentially, they're in the dark during the single most important technological revolution of their lifetimes, a revolution that's happening right before our very eyes. The purpose of this presentation is to survey the most popular modern data-driven AI tools. We're talking about easy-to-use, off-the-shelf machine learning models that you can use today to automate a variety of tasks in your products and services many of which are now currently better than humans at performing the equivalent task. As an overview of this presentation, first, we're gonna start by talking about AI tools for working with tables of data. Next, we'll learn about AI tools for working with text. Then we'll learn about AI tools for audio. Next, AI tools for images. Then AI for video. Then we'll learn how to wire these models together in order to create modular AI applications. And finally, we'll learn about AI for cyber physical systems, uh, things like robots and self-driving cars. We're going to start with the simplest tools and work our way down to the more complex and, in my opinion, the more interesting tools. Some of you will likely have seen some of the older, more basic tools that we're going to cover in the first half of the presentation. However, the second half of the presentation is going to be filled with some tools that are likely going to seem like total magic. Though I assure you that everything is 100% real. So if you're struggling to stay engaged early on in the presentation, please bear with me. Things will definitely get more interesting as we get into AI synthetically generated videos and applications and stuff like that. By the end of this presentation, I'll show you where to go for a full online course that's going to discuss all seven topics in much greater depth and is going to provide code demos for all of these tools as well. All right, so by the end of this presentation, if I've done my job, you should be able to identify a wide variety of modern data-driven AI tools. And this is gonna help you to generate ideas for how you can quickly and easily add AI automation into your own products and services. In addition, you'll learn how to recognize the common AI problem solution patterns. This approach will help you to identify what is technically feasible with your own products and services. However, I want to keep things very simple and keep this applicable to a general audience. In addition, yeah, we're going to skip over all of the math code and vendor specifics, as well as uh, skip over all of the classic AI tools that have been around for years. Things like heuristic search, dynamic programming, and expert systems. Uh, today, we're just going to be focused exclusively on modern data-driven AI. Uh, tools like machine learning, deep learning, and reinforcement learning, or tools that are built on top of these technologies. And think of this presentation like an enormous buffet of AI tools. We're going to be sampling lots of different flavors of AI today. However, there's just too many types of AI for us to taste all in one seating. So we just want to take very tiny bites of each topic today. If you find something that you're interested in, you can always dig deeper later. But by the end of this talk, if I've done my job, you should feel pleasantly full in terms of the knowledge that you've consumed, if not completely stuffed. So we've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. But first, before we get into the kind of meat and potatoes of the presentation, I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page about what AI is and what machine learning is. So to answer this question, we need to start with AI itself. So artificial intelligence is a subfield of computer science that attempts to create machines that act rationally in response to their environment. An AI is any machine that perceives its environment and chooses actions that maximize the likelihood of achieving a goal of some kind. Essentially, it's just a machine that takes data as input and produces the best output given what it currently knows. 
Some examples of AI include computers that can play chess, robots that can vacuum your floor, non-player characters in video games, and navigation software on your smartphone. Any computer algorithm that replicates some aspect of human intelligence or natural intelligence is essentially a form of artificial intelligence. All modern data-driven AI is largely based on machine learning. So what is machine learning? Machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence based on data and statistics. It involves machines learning how to solve problems without being explicitly programmed to do, and it does this by detecting statistical patterns in data. Essentially, with machine learning, we use existing data and a training algorithm to learn a model of the data. Then we can feed new data into that model that has never seen before, and the model will make a prediction about that new data. A machine learning model is essentially a function. It's simply a mapping from an input to an output. And in most basic cases, or in the most basic sense, we provide the model with data as an input, and then it's producing a prediction as an output. And this is a very important point to make because every example that we're gonna to see today is essentially just a mapping from some kind of input to some kind of output. There are two main tasks that we can perform or types of tasks that we can perform with machine learning models. We can either perform data analysis or we can perform data synthesis. Analysis is where we take complex high dimensional data as input and then reduce it down into lower dimensional more abstract data as output. For example, converting text, audio or video into a single number or label of some kind. Synthesis on the other hand is where we take lower dimensional more abstract data and we produce higher dimensional, more complex data as an output. For example, converting simple text descriptions into complex audio or video. Throughout this presentation, we're gonna group all of our models first by the type of data that they involve and second as either an analysis task or a synthesis task. And this will help you to build a better mental model of the landscape of all the various tasks that can be performed with modern data-driven AI. Finally, there are three main types of machine learning models. We have pre-trained models, augmented models, and custom models. Pre-trained models are off-the-shelf solutions. They've been previously trained by a third party to perform a general task and are ready to use with little to no effort. For example, Microsoft produces a pre-trained vision service that allows you to detect people's faces in an image. Custom models are do-it-yourself solutions. You have to provide the training data, the compute power, and the expertise to, to create the model to perform your specific task. For example, if you were trying to predict your customer revenue using your company's data, you'd need to create that model from scratch. Augmented models are somewhere in between. These models are pre-trained by a third party, but then you transfer the learning from the more general tasks that they pre-trained it for to your more specific tasks that you need it to do. For example, if you want to detect your company's logo in photos, you could augment a pre-trained image classifier to detect just your specific logo. Now, I've ordered these three types of models by their level of difficulty and cost, so I recommend that you always start with pre-trained models if possible and work your way to custom solutions only if or when necessary. Next, we'll learn how to use AI tools to work with text. Text is how we communicate information to one another in written language. It's the primary type of data that we encounter in books, articles, and emails. And as a result, it's one of the most valuable forms of unstructured data that exist in our world. Textual data are data that represent a body of text. For example, this passage from Shakespeare. We typically store textual data as an array of characters of an arbitrary length. Each letter, number, and symbol are represented as a binary value within this array, which is just a list of, of numbers or uh, characters. There are a variety of AI tools that we can use to perform text analysis, which is also known as natural language processing or NLP. These text analysis tools include text classification, sentiment analysis, entity recognition, and more. First, we have text classification. Text classification allows us to assign a body of text into two or more categories. In essence, it answers the question, what kind of text is this or what group does this text belong to? For example, we could classify inbound emails by the department that typically handles them. We provide the model with the text contained in an email message as input. Then the model produces a prediction of which department the email should be routed to as output. Text classification is useful anytime you have a collection of documents and you need to organize them into two or more categories or groups. For example, we can organize legal documents based on the type of case they involve, categorizing support tickets by the type of issue, 
and classifying emails as either spam or not spam. Second, we have sentiment analysis. And sentiment analysis allows us to determine the emotional sentiment of a body of text. Essentially, it answers the question, is this text positive or negative? For example, we could analyze product reviews to determine if they're favorable or unfavorable reviews of our product. We provide the model with the product review text as input, and then the model produces a sentiment score ranging from typically zero, which is very negative, to one, which would be very positive as its output. Sentiment analysis is useful anytime you need to determine the emotional sentiment of a body of text. For example, detecting high priority customer support emails based on the customer's tone, filtering out social media posts with overly negative sentiment, or for helping you write emails with a more positive and constructive tone. Third, we have entity recognition extracts named entities from a body of text. Essentially, it answers the question, what person, place, or thing do these words refer to? For example, we can use entity recognition to discover named entities in news articles. We provide the model with the text of each article as input, then the model produces a list of named entities, their locations in the text, and a confidence score for each entity as output. For example, or in this example, the words Microsoft and Google clearly refer to their respective companies. However, the word Amazon could either refer to the company or the river in South America. So the model needs to use the surrounding context to determine uh, which words correspond to what entities. It's how it decides which of these two categories that word would potentially fall into or which of these two entities that word is associated with. So entity recognition is useful anytime you want to determine what entities are contained in a body of text beyond simple word matching. For example, uh, improving document search using searchable entities, adding hyperlinks to entities in website articles, or extracting medical codes from patient, diagnost patient diagnostics in their medical records. So beyond the three uh, common text analysis tools that we've just seen, there's also a variety of other text analysis tools. For example, tone analysis, which is like sentiment analysis, but for other types of emotions. Language detection, which answers the question, what language is this text? And syntax analysis, which organizes words into a hierarchical tree representing each word, their part of speech, and their syntactical relationship. It's how these machines understand the language that we're speaking or the language that they're reading. So now in addition to the text analysis tools that we've just seen, there's also a variety of text synthesis tools as well. These include AI tools like text completion, text generation, and language translation. First, we have text completion. Text completion allows us to predict missing words or upcoming words. In essence, it answers the question, what word is missing or what words will likely come next? For example, we can use text completion to predict what words a user is likely to type next on their smartphone. We provide the model with the text of incomplete sentences input, then the model produces the most likely text and a confidence score for that text as output. Text completion is useful anytime you need to predict uh, missing or future words in a body of text. For example, in just in case this is like a culturally, culturally not a reference, the cow jumped over the moon is a nursery rhyme that's common in the United States and I believe the UK. So in the event you were wondering why a cow would be jumping over the moon, it's because it's very common in English expressions. But I don't know if that translates well to every part of the world. I should probably check on that. But text completion is essentially useful anytime you need to predict missing or future words in a body of text. For example, auto-completing sentences while you're typing, correcting transcription errors while transcribing uh, videos, or verifying sentence syntax by checking the probability of occurrence of each word in a sentence to make sure the words that are supposed to be there rather than other words that shouldn't be there. Second, we have text generation. Now, text generation allows us to synthesize a body of text from a simple prompt. Essentially, it allows us to create entire documents just by providing a few written instructions. For example, we can use text completion to compose entirely new emails for us automatically. We provide the model with a simple text prompt as input telling it what we want it to do or what we want it to And then the model produces the text of a full email as output. Text generation is useful anytime you need to synthesize text-based content using a short prompt or table of data or something like that. For example, automatically generating articles for a website. We can do this with the product listings, replying to simple questions in text support emails, or automatically generating an FAQ uh, from support tickets. Third, we have language translation allows us to translate text from one, la one language into another language. Essentially, it answers the question, how do I say this sentence or phrase in another language? 
For example, we can use language translation to convert the following text from English into Mandarin Chinese. We provide the model with text in English as input, then the model produces the equivalent text in Chinese as output. Language translation is useful anytime you need to convert text from one language into another language. For example, translating your website for an international audience, translating support emails for, from foreign customers, or reading documents written in a foreign language. In addition to the text synthesis tools that we've just seen, there's also a variety of other text synthesis tools available, including text summarization, which reduces a larger body of text into a much smaller synopsis of the text, language transliteration, which converts words from one alphabet into words that are pronounceable in a second alphabet, and program synthesis, which converts visual descriptions and pseudocode into actual source code. So we essentially tell the computer what we want it to do in plain English, and it will then produce the code that will perform that task. And this actually works quite well. I've used it for some basic or simple tasks, but even Microsoft thinks this is going to be a very huge feature in the very near future. So as we can see, there's a wide variety of tools in the AI Developers Toolkit for working with text. And these include both tools for text analysis as well as text synthesis. So third, we're going to learn how to use AI tools to work with audio. So audio is how we hear the world and speak to one another. It captures the sounds that we hear and the words that we speak. And as a result, audio is essential to our understanding of the world around us. Audio data are how we are typically stored as a one-dimensional array of numeric values. Each value represents the, a sample of the amplitude of a sound wave recorded at a specific time. The samples are then ordered across time to create a temporal representation of the recorded sounds. For monaural sound recordings, we just have a single audio channel and thus a single array of values. However, for stereo sound recordings, we have two channels, a left channel and a right channel. And as a result, stereo audio data will contain two arrays, one for each audio channel synchronized across time. Now, there are a variety of AI tools that we can use for audio analysis, and these include sound classification, speaker recognition, speech recognition, and more. First, we have sound classification. Sound classification allows us to assign a sound to two or more labeled categories. Essentially, it answers the question, what kind of sound is this? For example, we can use sound classification to determine which animal produced a specific type of noise or vocalization. So we provide the model with the following audio sample as input, I'm gonna play some audio here and hopefully everyone will be able to hear it. So in, if you guys couldn't hear the cat meowing, uh, let me know and I'll, I'll change it. So then the model is gonna produce a predicted category and a confidence score based on the sound it heard as output. So sound classification is useful anytime we're trying to assign sounds uh, to two or more categories. For example, detecting gunshots in audio surveillance systems, uh, predicting mechanical failures from acoustical anomalies, and identifying various species of animals for wildlife conservation. Second, we have speaker recognition, which is also known as voice recognition. Speaker recognition allows us to use the sound of someone's voice in order to identify the speaker. Essentially, it answers the question, whose voice is this? For example, we can use speaker recognition to determine who's speaking in an audio recording. We provide the model with a sample of a human voice as input. Hi, my name is Matthew Renzi. Like that. And then the model produces the identity of the speaker and a confidence score as output. Speaker recognition is useful anytime you need to know whose voice is speaking. For example, authorizing the user for voice control devices, personalizing voice responses based on who's speaking, or identifying who's speaking each line of dialogue in a movie. Third, we have speech recognition. Speech recognition allows us to convert spoken words into a string of text. Essentially, it answers the question, what's being said here? For example, we can use speech recognition to convert spoken dialogue into a written transcript. We provide the model with the following audio as input. Hi, my name is Matthew Renzi. Then the model produces the corresponding text as output. Speech recognition is useful anytime you need to convert spoken words into text for processing. For example, controlling computers via voice commands, dictating spoken words into a written document, and adding closed captions to the dialogue in a video. Back to speech recognition. So speech recognition is useful anytime you need to convert spoken words into text for processing. For example, uh, controlling vo uh, computers with voice commands, dictating spoken words into written documents, and adding closed captions uh, for the dialogue in a video. 
Beyond these three key examples, there's also a variety of other audio analysis tools. For example, a sound detection, which identifies the beginning and end of each sound event in a noisy environment. Sound localization, which locates the source of a sound in a three-dimensional space. And song recognition, which can identify a song just based on a short audio snippet. It hears a little bit of the song and can tell you what that song is. So now, in addition to the audio analysis tools that we've just seen, there's also a variety of audio synthesis tools, and these include a speech synthesis, voice synthesis, speech translation, and more. So first, we have speech synthesis, also known as text-to-speech. So speech synthesis allows a computer to communicate to us using spoken words. Essentially, it allows a computer to speak aloud using an artificial human voice. For example, we can use speech synthesis to read text out loud. We provide the model with the following text as input, then the model produces the following audio as output. Hi, my name is Matthew Renzi. And now it sounds like a human voice, but it doesn't necessarily sound like my voice, but we'll get to that in a second. So speech synthesis is useful anytime you need a computer to speak in a human, natural sounding voice. For example, dictating responses to requests for hands-free applications, narrating the text contained in documents, and for creating more natural user interfaces. Second, we have voice synthesis. Now, voice synthesis allows us to synthesize a person's voice using existing audio and text edits to a transcript. Essentially, it allows us to edit a person's spoken words just like editing text in a word processor. For example, we can use voice synthesis to change a mistake in a recorded sentence. We provide the model with the original audio and an edited transcription as input. Hi, my name is Matthew Renzi. Then the model produces an updated audio output containing the synthesized edits as its output. Hello, I'm Matthew Renzi. I'll be your virtual instructor today. And so keep in mind, that's my voice, but it's not actually me speaking. That was synthesized by the computer using previous samples of my voice. It's not perfect, but it's getting better each year. And with another year or two, it will be probably indistinguishable from me actually speaking that line. So voice synthesis is useful anytime you need to edit a specific person's voice uh, in an audio source. For example, editing mistakes in a recording from a podcast, eliminating the need for audio overdubs in films, and for creating natural sounding AI voice agents. Third, we have speech translation. Speech translation allows us to convert spoken words uh, from one language into spoken words in another language. Essentially, it allows us to translate speech in real time. For example, we can use speech translation to translate spoken English into the Spanish equivalent. We provide the model with the following audio as input. Hi, my name is Matthew Renzi. Then the model produces the following audio as output. Hola, mi nombre es Mateo Renzi. And so once again, that's not in my specific voice, but it's actually much better at pronunciation. And Microsoft and a couple other companies are working on a technology that will allow you to do real-time translation into other languages using your own voice as the, the actual sound. So it'll even make the, the dialect distinctions and the, the, the parts of my voice that wouldn't sound natural because I'm not a natural Spanish, natural born Spanish speaker. So speech translation is useful anytime you need to translate one speaker's language into a listener's language. For example, translating conversations in real time, translating a keynote for an international audience, or automating audio overdubs into multiple languages for video, TV, and film. So beyond the three common examples that we've seen so far, there's also a variety of other audio synthesis tools. For example, sound generation, which allows us to add realistic sound effects to silent videos. Instrument translation, which can take a song performed by one instrument like this, and then recreate it using a second instrument. And music generation, which allows us to compose entirely new songs from scratch, like this 100% fake Frank Sinatra song, Hot Tub Christmas. When you listen to this, keep in mind that Frank Sinatra did not sing a single line in this song or play any of the instruments. This is 100% generated by a machine. It's Christmas time and you know what that means. Oh, it's hot tub time. As I like the tree, this year will be a song. So they essentially just fed the algorithm a bunch of Frank Sinatra songs so it could learn what his songs sound like. And then they gave it some lyrics and it synthesized his voice over the top of music that it thought would sound like what the lyrics are singing about. And then it just synthesized that song, generated it from scratch. 
So as we can see, there's a variety of modern tools in the AI Developers Toolkit for working with audio. And these include both tools for audio analysis as well as audio synthesis. So fourth, we're gonna learn how to use AI tools for working with images. Now, our world is highly visual. We derive most of our information about the world through our eyes. The spaces that we navigate, the faces that we interact with, and the documents we read are all processed visually. As a result, images are one of the most valuable types of unstructured data for modern AI. An image captures a digital picture of the world. However, if we zoom in, we can see that a digital image is actually composed of a bunch of tiny squares. Excuse me. We call this a raster of pixels, a two-dimensional grid of picture elements. We represent this raster of pixels as a two-dimensional array or matrix of numeric values. Each numeric value corresponds to the intensity of the light captured at a specific X and Y position of the image sensor. For color images, we typically have a separate raster of pixels for each color channel. As a result, a color image will be composed of three grids corresponding to the red, green, and blue color channels. Similar to audio, we can have both a monocular image, that is a flat two-dimensional image, or we can have a stereo image, which allows us to see depth via optical parallax. So depth allows us to determine the position of an object in space relative to the observer. Now, there are a variety of AI tools that we can use for image analysis, and these include tools like uh, image classification, object detection, face recognition, and more. So first, we have image classification. Image classification allows us to assign an image uh, to two or more labeled categories. Essentially, it answers the question, what is contained in this image? For example, we can use image classification to tag the content of an image. We provide the model with an image's input, and then the model produces a category label and a confidence score for that label as output. Image classification is useful anytime you're trying to assign a categorical label or multiple tags to a collection of images. For example, auto-tagging images on social media posts, detecting product defects via visual inspection, or diagnosing medical issues like detecting certain types of skin cancer. Second, we have object detection allows us to identify the location of various objects in an image. Essentially, it answers the question, where are the objects located in this image? For example, we can use object detection to identify various items contained in, or various things contained in an image. We provide the model with an image's input, and then the model produces the coordinates of a bounding box for each object inside that image as output. Object detection is useful anytime you have images with multiple objects that need to be located. For example, counting the number of objects in an image, detecting people in surveillance videos, or detecting various obstacles in self-driving cars. Third, we have face recognition allows us to identify a person contained in an image by their facial features. Essentially, it answers the question, who's in this image? For example, we can use face recognition to determine who is contained in our photos. We provide the model with an image's input, and then the model produces the identity of the person or people contained in the image and a confidence score as output. Face recognition is useful anytime you need to identify people in images. For example, identifying customers as they enter your store, identifying the occupants of your office building, and tagging your friends on social media. So beyond the three examples of image analysis that we've seen, there's also a variety of other image analysis tools. For, um, in fact, there's uh, far too many of them to cover with even a brief description. So we're just gonna quickly go through a highlight of uh, the most important. So we have reverse image search, which allows us to find images that are visually similar to a source image. We have image captioning, which generates a text description of what is contained in an image. We have image segmentation, also known as semantic segmentation, which is like object detection, but detects and assigns a type of object to every pixel in an image. Other face analysis tools, which allow us to detect faces, compare faces, detect facial landmarks, determine gender and age, detect facial features, and classify human emotions. Other body analysis tools, which allow us to estimate pose, recognize gestures, count fingers, and detect adult or racy content and other document analysis tools, which allow us to extract printed text, handwritten text, form data, and tables, all from documents. So in addition to the image analysis tools that we've just seen, there's also a variety of image synthesis tools. And these include uh, tools like image completion, image generation, and image style transfer. 
So first we have image completion, which is also known as image in painting or content aware fill. Image completion allows us to fill in missing areas of an image with a best guess as to the missing contents. Essentially, it answers the question, what should go in this missing part of the image? For example, we can use image completion to digitally remove unwanted objects from our images. We provide the model with an image in a mask containing the content to be removed. Then the model produces a new image with the missing area filled in output. So image completion is useful anytime you need to replace part of an image with a synthetic alternative. For example, uh, digitally removing objects from images, filling in the missing areas outside of a photo's borders, and restoring image quality to old and damaged photos. Next, we have image generation allows us to create artificial image given just a short text description. Essentially, it answers the question, what would this thing I'm describing look like? For example, we can create visual content simply by describing the object that we want to see. We provide the model with a text description as input, then the model produces a synthetic image that matches that description as output. And now keep in mind, this didn't search for a picture of a bird that matches the description. It actually generated that image of the bird from scratch. It knows what the color yellow looks like, it knows what a bird looks like, and it knows what a black crown with a short black pointed beak would look like as well. So it created that thing from scratch. Image synthesis is useful anytime you need to create a new image from scratch. For example, creating content for presentation slides, rapidly ideating on new product designs, and creating entirely new and unique works of art. Third, we have image style transfer, which is also known as neural style transfer. So image style transfer allows us to apply the stylistic characteristics of one image to another image. Essentially, it allows us to restyle an image in a completely different visual style. For example, we can make our photos look like a painting from a famous artist. We provide the model with a source image and then a second image containing a visual style as input. Then the model produces a third image containing the source content, but in the new visual style as output. Image style transfer is useful anytime you need to restylize an image. For example, applying artistic filters to your digital photos, rebranding images with your company's visual style, and creating new VR and gaming experiences. Beyond these three image synthesis tools that we've seen, there's also a variety of other tools available for image synthesis. For example, image coloration, which allows us to convert black and white images into full color images. Image super resolution, which allows us to zoom and enhance the image quality of low resolution images. And I know what you're thinking, this is like sci-fi stuff from the CSI TV shows that doesn't actually exist, but it actually does. And it works relatively well for certain tasks, but not all tasks. You're not gonna be able to read the license plate off of the reflection of someone's eye or something like that, like they do in some of the movies. But you can, I actually did this one right here myself. You can really zoom in on people and it recreates what that eye would look like if you had the original high resolution image. We can also do depth map estimation, which allows us to create a depth map from a two dimensional image. Face generation, which allows us to create entirely synthetic human faces given just a few attributes or physical characteristics. Now keep in mind, this person's face does not exist. That was synthesized based on a computer's knowledge of what people's faces look like and those input descriptions. And this also leads us to sketch generation, which can convert a hand-drawn sketch of a person into a synthetic face. And now once again, that person's face doesn't exist. It's being constructed in real time as the person is sketching what they want the face to look like. And image interpolation, which can fuse the attributes of two images into a single image. So as we can see, there's a variety of tools in the AI Developers Toolkit for working with images. And these include both tools for image analysis as well as image synthesis. All right, so next we're gonna learn how to use AI tools uh, to work with video. So the real world isn't composed of static images. Instead, we perceive the world as a rich multimedia experience. When we combine images over time synced with audio, so when we combine images over time synced with audio, we get video. So video allows AI to perceive uh, its world as a continuous and fluid audiovisual experience. Video data are composed of both a visual component and an audio component. The visual component consists of a series of static images that are all stacked over time. The audio component is synced up with the images to produce a temporally coherent audiovisual experience. Video data can either be mono, that is two-dimensional images, or stereo, which are three-dimensional images. 
In addition, the audio can once again be either mono, which is one channel audio, or stereo, which is two channel audio. Adding additional, additional audio or video channels allows us uh, to improve our models and allows them to perform more complex tasks. So with video data, keep in mind that we can perform all of the audio and image tasks that we've previously discussed, which are all of the things there on the slide plus more. However, the temporally coherent sequences of images and audio over time allow us to perform some new tasks as well. So we're gonna focus on those new tasks. So there's a variety of AI tools that we can use for video analysis. And these include motion detection, object tracking, action recognition, and more. First, we have motion detection. Motion detection allows us to identify movement in a video over time. Essentially, it answers the question, is anything moving in this video? For example, we can determine if anything is moving within a mask region of a security video. We provide the model with a video and a polygon mask for the detection region as input. Then the model produces a motion label and a confidence score for each frame as output. Motion detection is useful anytime you need to determine if something is moving within a region of a video. For example, detecting people moving in surveillance videos, monitoring the movement of wildlife on game preserves, and helping collaborative robots detect humans moving within their workspace. Second, we have object tracking. Object tracking allows us to track the movement of an object in a video over time. Essentially, it answers the question, how are these objects moving over time? For example, we can use object tracking to track the position, velocity, and acceleration of moving objects in a video. We provide the model with a video as input, then the model produces a sequence of bounding boxes and the corresponding object ID for each object that's being tracked as its output. Object tracking is useful anytime you need to know how an object moves over time. For example, tracking people walking in surveillance videos, following the faces of moving participants during a video call, and avoiding pedestrians in a self-driving car. Third, we have action recognition, also known as activity detection. Action recognition allows us to classify various actions occurring in a video. Essentially, it answers the question, what's happening in this video? For example, we can use action recognition to understand human activities occurring in a video. We provide the model with a video containing human activities as input, then the model produces an activity label and a confidence score as output. Action recognition is useful anytime you need to detect what's happening in a video. For example, detecting unlawful activities in a surveillance video, analyzing activities occurring in sports videos, and collaboration between humans and robots. Beyond the three video analysis tools we've just seen, there's also a variety of other video analysis tools. For example, optical flow, which allows us to track the path of moving objects over time, gait recognition, which allows us to identify a person based on the way they walk, and lip reading, which allows us to convert the movement of lips from spoken words into text. In addition to the video analysis tools we've just seen, there's also a variety of other uh, AI tools for video synthesis. These include in video interpolation, video prediction, video to video transfer, and more. First, we have video interpolation allows us to predict missing video frames given both previous and subsequent frames. Essentially, it answers the question, what content should go in this missing video frame? For example, we can create slow motion footage from existing uh, regular speed footage. We provide the model with the low frame rate video as input, then the model produces a high frame rate video as output. Video interpolation is useful for a variety of video editing tasks. For example, upscaling low frame rate videos to high frame rate videos, restoring old film strips with, uh, from manual crank cameras with inconsistent frame rates, and smoothing out multiplex security footage. Second, we have video prediction. Video prediction allows us to predictively synthesize future video frames based on a few preceding video frames. Essentially, it answers the question, what will likely happen next in this video? For example, given 10 frames of this golf video, we can predict the next 30 frames. We provide the model with a few frames of video as input, then the model produces a prediction of the next few frames of video as output. So video prediction is currently an active area of research, so there aren't many practical applications yet. However, as you can imagine, this tool will likely be quite useful for a wide variety of video generation tasks in the near future. Third, we have video transfer, also known as video to video transfer. 
Video transfer allows us to synthesize entirely new videos from more simplified input videos or more simplified sources. Essentially, it allows us to create entirely new videos from scratch. For example, we can use a semantically segmented video to produce a completely original video from scratch. We provide the model with a video containing semantically labeled pixels as input. Then the model produces a realistic video that represents the labels as output. Once again, uh, the output video that you're seeing is completely generated from scratch. That doesn't exist. It's just synthetically generated based upon what the input is telling it should go there, a road, a car, trees, and then it just generates what it thinks that would look like. So video transfer is also an active area of research, so there aren't currently many practical applications yet. However, once again, you can imagine what we might be doing with this technology in the very near future. In fact, one of the most interesting potential applications I saw was video game generating realistic looking video games in real time. They just uh, render a semantically segmented set of images uh, in polygons and then produce what the real world would look like if, if given those inputs. It actually looked pretty good. They did Grand Theft Auto with it. So beyond the three examples that we've seen so far, uh, there's also a variety of uh, other AI tools for video synthesis. And these include things like video completion, which is like image completion, but for motion video. Essentially, you're able to digitally remove somebody without having to erase them from each frame. The machine does it automatically. We've also got video face synthesis, which allows us to create synthetic videos of people speaking. Once again, the, this person does not exist. They're completely computer generated. Video pose transfer, which allows us to create synthetic videos of people's movement. And once again, they don't exist either, or they're not actually dancing in the, it's just synthesized. And video lip syncing, which allows us to apply the lip movements from one audio track to a video track. And so I'll show a quick example of this that some of you may have already seen. To help families refinance their homes, to invest in things like high-tech manufacturing, clean energy, and the infrastructure that creates good new jobs. So as we can see, there are a variety of tools in the AI Developers Toolkit for working with video. And these include tools for video analysis, as well as tools for video synthesis. All right, so now we're gonna switch gears and learn how to use these various AI tools to build modular AI applications. So all of the tools we've seen so far solve relatively simple and isolated problems of perception and cognition. These standalone models might be enough to add a few new AI features to an existing product or service. However, many real-world problems uh, require much more complex solutions than simply mapping from one type of data into another type of data. There are numerous cases where we need multiple a to combine multiple AI models together to create a full application. For example, an application that detects both the tone of our emails as well as our spelling and grammar, or an application that listens to voice commands and then provides voice responses, or an application that both identifies a person's faces and the actions that they're performing. As we've seen many times now, modern data-driven AI is all just a function. We're just training a model that can map some kind of input to some kind of output. We saw how we can apply this general pattern to analyze tables, text, audio, images, and video. In addition, we saw how we can apply the same pattern to synthesize new tables, text, audio, images, and video. But this is just the beginning of the different types of problems that we can apply this pattern to. There's a multitude of other types of sensors and actuators that exist in our world. In addition, just like mathematical functions, we can combine and compose these models together as well. We can combine the outputs of multiple models together to make more powerful predictions. This allows us to make predictions that were not possible using a single type of input data, or to improve the accuracy of a prediction by fusing together data from multiple overlapping sensory inputs. For example, we could combine both images and audio from a web camera for user recognition. Using both a person's visual appearance and their voice allows us to more accurately identify the user. We can also chain together multiple models so that the input from one model becomes the or sorry, the output from one model becomes the input to another model. And this allows us to apply AI to multiple layers of data operating at various levels of abstraction. For example, we can chain object detection and image classification together to perform object classification. So the object detector will first detect or locate the objects in the image, then we'll crop that image contained within the bounding box, and then the image classifier will classify the type of object in each cropped image. The whole pipeline or sequence then creates object classification from image classification and object detection. 
So many real world AI applications combine and chain these various models together to form an AI pipeline. We take some complex high dimensional sensory data as input and we reduce it into a single action, decision, or unit of data as output. You can think of it like building AI systems with Lego building blocks. You can mix and match various AI models together based on the inputs that you have and the outputs that you need. Unfortunately, most AI models don't just magically snap together though. So we typically have to glue these bricks together using a bunch of code. Interestingly, there's a way that we can avoid needing any of the building blocks or glue at all. We can build what's called an end-to-end -end AI application. With modular AI applications, we're wiring together a bunch of small, highly specialized machine learning models together to solve a specific problem. However, with end-to-end -end AI, we're training a single large machine learning model to perform all of the same tasks at once. And there are various pros and cons to each of these two approaches to creating AI applications. Modular AI systems are easier to create, maintain, and debug. However, they require domain expertise and lots of code to wire these modules together. End-to-end -end applications are more efficient, more powerful, and less biased. However, they are much harder to create, require much more data, and are not transparent at all. So my general advice is to always start with a modular AI application. Start by decomposing a problem into its constituent subproblems then solve each smaller subproblem with a specifically focused machine learning model. Finally, you can wire the various models together to create the full solution. Once you've solved the problem with the modular approach, you can always upgrade to an end-to-end -end system later. However, you now have the benefit of being able to use the modular application to help train, verify, and debug the end-to-end -end application. And this can be a very powerful one-two combo for solving complex problems with artificial intelligence and machine learning. However, uh, how to pull that off is outside of the scope of our presentation. But as we can see, both modular and end-to-end -end AI applications are now very powerful tools that exist in the AI developer's toolkit. All right, so let's wrap things up and learn where to go uh, for more information so you can take your next steps on your AI journey. First, I recommend that you watch my full online course, the AI Developer's Toolkit on Pluralsight. You all have uh, subscriptions to it, so you can watch it free of charge. It contains everything uh, that we covered today Plus, it provides more in-depth coverage, code demos for popular tools, and additional learning resources. So feel free to check it out and to share it with others as well. Second, I recommend that you learn more about the overall picture of artificial intelligence. So I've got several courses that cover the basics of AI, data science, and machine learning. And once again, you've got free access to all of these courses through your Pluralsight subscription through Serenzi Global. Third, I recommend that you practice. So knowing what a deep neural network is an entirely different thing than being able to train a deep neural network to detect fraud or something like that. So if you would like more hands-on experience, here are a few resources that I recommend you take a look at in order to get started. They're just uh, quick and easy ways to, to get started building things. Fourth, be sure to check out my website. As you guys have probably seen already, I've got tons of uh, articles, videos, and courses on this topic and more. And uh, if you know anyone that needs any uh, consulting or training on AI, be sure to send them my way. Fifth, I encourage you to engage with me and the AI learning community. We don't really have a way to rate these webinars, but feel free to send me some feedback, ask questions during the Q&A session, send me comments on social media, and just let me know what you think of the presentation overall. So finally, to quickly summarize, today we learned about the most popular tools for modern data-driven AI that now exist in the AI Developers Toolkit. We learned about AI tools for text, AI tools for audio, AI tools for images, AI for video. And finally, we learned how to wire these modules together, models together to create modular AI applications. So there are tremendous opportunities ahead for those who are willing to invest in the future of AI now. It's easier now than ever to get started with these modern data-driven AI tools. If you're a software developer or an IT professional, the time to get started is right now. So what are you waiting for? Start building your AI developer's toolkit today. All right, so we've got about five minutes left before the top of the hour. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask them, and uh, I will get them answered as best as possible. I'm sure Anna has all sorts of questions. Hi, this is Anna. <laughs> How's it going? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Dude, I have a question that I don't know, you probably have answered already, but I would like to get more details for the business system analyst working for a company who makes a AI software. 
Yep. What are the building blocks that I will have to have a basic understanding knowledge in order for me, I will be writing requirements and stuff like that. So what does a BA will need to know? I think attending this session was probably the, the best thing you could have done because you've now seen the various types of AI that exist to solve yes. various isolated problems. And you've also now seen how we wire them together. So combining this with this in order to solve this specific problem. But beyond that, you've also now seen the problem solution kind of pattern. It's okay, here's this perceptual problem we're trying to solve, and here's a solution to solve that. And how you can essentially um, create these models from scratch if you need to, or you can use the off the shelf stuff, which is what I recommend doing first. So seeing that there's off the shelf solutions to all these problems, seeing that what you need to do if you need to create these from scratch, and then that part in the middle, the augmented models where you can take an existing pre-trained model and then train it to do just what you need uh, to have done. So I think like this presentation, honestly, is probably one of the best things you could have done in order to fill in a lot of those gaps. And then if you want to go deeper, I, I recommend just checking out the, the online course because I'm going to actually show code demos so you can see what this actually looks like in, in real life. I actually would like models. to see it. And, yep. and then beyond and, that, the other part that we skipped was we didn't cover tables to, today. And tables are one of the, the things that are most common. But unfortunately, when I give this presentation, if you give the, the short version of it, most people don't find the tables interesting enough to keep their attention. So I usually skip that part. But you'll definitely want to watch the, the module on how to use AI table analysis and uh, table synthesis. And then the last part we had to skip, which is essentially cyber physical systems. So the last part that we had to skip teaches you how we build robots, essentially, in self-driving cars. The whole process that these uh, AI systems go through in order to train and then learn how to solve problems on their own. But Matthew, as a BA, I think just... I don't need to go into what the deep learning is, the reinforcement, all those things mathematically. I don't, no. if I'm going to be done yeah. writing requirements, it's going to be more about the outcome of yep. this AR product, right? Yep, I'm in agreement. I don't think you need to know anything about the math or even vendor specifics. I think you just need to know the general, how these things work, what they're capable of doing, what things they're not capable of doing, and then just how the whole problem solution pattern works in uh, creating AI applications. Okay, excellent. Cool. You answered my question. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great day, everyone. And thanks for joining. Okay.